ITP is defined as isolated thrombocytopenia without anemia or leukopenia and without another apparent cause. It is relatively common cause of thrombocytopenia with incidence of 2 to 10 cases per 100,000 patient years. It has a biphasic age distribution. Based on the duration of disease, it can be classified as newly diagnosed ITP, persistent ITP, and chronic ITP. It may have triggers such as CLL, infections like HIV, Hepatitis C, H. pylori, and autoimmune diseases like SLE and RA. Now let's talk about the pathophysiology. Initially, the splenic macrophages sample the platelet antigens and present it via MHC type 2 to TS0 cells. TS0 cells then predominantly differentiate to TH1 cells. TH1 cells stimulate the cytotoxic T cells which directly destroys the platelet. In addition, they also stimulate B cells to produce immunoglobulins. These immunoglobulins bind to the platelets. The opsonized platelets then bind with receptors in splenic macrophage. This activates splenic tyrosine kinase and the platelets are phagocytosed and destroyed. Most of the times ITP is asymptomatic. In some cases it leads to mucocutaneous bleeding like petechiae, purpura, oral mucosal or gastrointestinal bleeding. Rarely it can lead to severe bleeding as well. Hemorrhagic blisters in mucous membranes is called wet purpura and it is predictor of more severe bleeding and it should prompt reappraisal of platelet count and need for ITP therapy. Fatigue tracks very well with platelet count and it affects about 50% of patients at diagnosis. It may be due to concomitant anemia, psychological stress or peripheral inflammation induced neuroendocrine dysfunction. Counterintuitively, patients with ITP have twofold increased risk of deep vein thrombosis. Lymphadenopathy and splenomegaly are typically absent and their presence should prompt investigation for other etiologies of thrombocytopenia. Now let's talk about investigations. CBC and CMP must be performed. In addition, presence of triggers must be evaluated. HIV and HCV testing are mandatory. H. pylori testing must be performed in patients with GI symptoms. Thyroid function testing may be performed as there are rare reports of ITP associated with thyroid disorders. In addition, coagulation studies must be performed as well. This is to investigate for other causes of thrombocytopenia, for example liver disease. Peripheral blood smear should be done to exclude pseudothrombocytopenia, microangiopathic hemolytic anemia, and hereditary platelet disorders. Antiplatelet antibodies should not be tested as they are non-sensitive and non-specific. Bone marrow examination are unreliable and non-diagnostic in ITP and they should only be performed in case of atypical features like unexplained anemia, lymphadenopathy or splenomegaly or failure to respond to initial therapy or in elderly patients in whom myelodysplasia is suspected. So the bottom line is ITP is a diagnosis of exclusion and there are no gold standard laboratory tests for its diagnosis. The most compelling evidence supporting a diagnosis of ITP is a platelet response to ITP specific therapy. Now let's talk about treatment. The goals of treatment are to treat or prevent significant bleeding, not to normalize the platelet count. Diagnosis of ITP does not imply that the therapy is required. Patients can be divided to three categories. In category 1, we have patients who are asymptomatic with platelet counts greater than 30,000. No treatment is needed in this case. In category 2, we have patients with minor mucosal bleeding or platelet counts less than 30,000. Treatment is required in this case. Either glucocorticoids or IVIG can be used. They have similar efficacy. IVIG works fast, but it is difficult to administer and expensive. So they are only used if rapid action is desired or if glucocorticoids fail. So the drug used initially is almost always glucocorticoids. Either prednisone or dexamethasone can be used. Dexamethasone has better response at 14 days, but it has similar late response at 1 year compared with prednisone. As prednisone has higher mineralocorticoid action, side effects like weight gain, edema, hypertension are more common, but neuropsychiatric side effects are more common with dexamethasone. Now let's talk about severe and critical bleeding. 
Critical bleeding means bleeding into a critical anatomical site, for example the brain or spinal cord, a bleeding that causes hemodynamic instability or respiratory compromise. Severe bleeding implies bleeding resulting in drop of hemoglobin more than 2 grams per deciliter or requiring transfusion of two or more units of packed RPCs. In such cases, kitchen sink approach is used. Platelet transfusions, IVIC and glucocorticoids are used all at once. But RCTs are lacking and the use of these treatments is supported only by small observational studies. What happens if patients don't respond to 3 months of first line therapy? Second line therapy must be initiated. Excessive use of glucocorticoids is a common error in ITP management. The second line therapies include rituximab, splenectomy, TPO receptor agonists, TPO mimetics, and fostamatinib. First, let's talk about rituximab. Rituximab is antibody against CD20 of B cell. It destroys the B cell by antibody dependent cell mediated cytotoxicity and complement activation. It causes side effects like infusion reaction, serum sickness, and cardiac arrhythmias. It also causes reactivation of hepatitis B and it interferes with response to polysaccharide vaccines. In patients who may subsequently undergo splenectomy, we must first administer immunizations prior to rituximab. Now let's talk about splenectomy. Splenectomy removes the major site of platelet destruction. But splenectomy should be delayed for at least one year after diagnosis because of the potential for spontaneous remission in the first year. Although it has high rate of durable remission, inability to predict which patients will have a response and presence of other highly efficacious second-line therapies has led to its decreased utilization. TPO receptor agonists like L-thrombopag, avatrombopag, and TPO mimetics like romiplostin can be used in refractory ITP. Side effects include increased bone matter reticulin, but no evidence for development of progressive or irreversible bone marrow fibrosis, hepatotoxicity with l thrombopag, severe thrombocytopenia following discontinuation of treatment, and increased risk of thrombosis in patients with pre-existing risk factors. Another second-line therapy is fostamatinib. It is oral splenic tyrosine kinase inhibitor. It inhibits SYK kinase-mediated IgG FC gamma receptor signaling. It has been approved for use in ITP in whom one previous therapy has failed. If the second-line therapies fail, drugs like azathioprine, cyclophosphamide, cyclosporine, danazole, dapsone, mycophenolate, and vinca alkaloids can be used. They act by inhibiting the T cell, but data to support their use is limited to only retrospective observational studies. Now, let's talk about prognosis. Most patients with ITP will eventually reach a safe, stable platelet count as a result of spontaneous remission or therapy. Mortality rate in people with ITP is similar to or only marginally higher than age mesh population. Patients with ITP are more likely to die of conditions unrelated to ITP than to ITP or its treatment. That's all for today. Please like, leave a comment and subscribe. Thank you.